In the charts the artists thrive in the red hot summer of 65. Great hits came, great hits went, chart kings ruled with confidence, and so into the top 10 we will dive. News flash people, there are sightings of the actual Beatles themselves this week up close and in the flesh. Otherwise a great variety on the charts for Valentine's Day 1965. Let's kick off with the section that has some disturbingly right wing political views. Hello and goodbye. And it's one in and one out this week, but what a one it is. You've lost that love and feeling by the Righteous Brothers, one of the jewels in the crown of producer Phil Spector. Why LTLF, as I like to call it, spent seven weeks in the top ten and went all the way to number one, where it dispatched the current number one, staying at the top for an all too short single week. It replaced a former single week number one in Little Red Rooster by the Rolling Stones, which tumbled out of the 10 to replace YLTLF at number 14 after seven weeks in the display circle. And while YLTLF is the next number one, the hit that replaced it at the top isn't even on the charts yet. But here's a hint, it was an Australian group that did it into the top 10 and of course it's the Righteous Brothers in only their third week on the chart having hopped 27 14 10 according to BMI this is the most played song on American radio and television in the 20th century with over 8 million plays written by the legendary team of Barry Mann and Cynthia Wheel expect a Righteous by Jambo on them soon this was their first number one hit and Phil Spector's third he'd top the charts with To Know Him Is To Love Him by the Teddy Bears and He's A Rebel by the Crystals Spectre was very sneaky with this song, altering the time on the labels to 3 minutes and 5 seconds instead of the real run time of 3 minutes 50. DJs would balk at the songs of 3 minute 50 length, so shorter run time tricked them into playing it and then wondering why their playlists were running long at the end of the night. Righteous brother Bobby Hatfield, who was relegated to a very minor part on the song, sung largely by Bill Medley, asked Spectre what he expected him to do with the rest of the session. Spectre told him, well, you can go directly to the bank. Nine is fine, as in I feel fine, a hit record for the band that was literally the Beatles. The Beatles. It was, in fact, a five-week number one, now plummeting down the charts for oblivion. But it was to linger another month in the lower reaches before ending its 17-week run and slipping into the fond memory as probably the last single of the long, glorious, proverbial summer that was Beatlemania. Eight is erstwhile Bond movie themester Matt Munro, who bought his smooth, flexible baritone to walk away. Munro battled through the 50s as a middling singer before forming a lifelong friendship with George Martin, the man who came to be the producer of the actual Beatles themselves. Martin produced his first hits and Munro quickly became a staple in England, hitting the top five 20 times, Walk Away being his biggest hit, making number four. Munro has the honour of being the first artist ever to record and have a hit with Yesterday, predating even the band that, in French, they call Les Bitals. Seven is Bobby Vinton, one of the most successful vocalists of the post-rock and roll and pre-British invasion era, with his four US number one hits. He only managed one in Australia with Roses Are Red, but this week's Mr Lonely was a handy hit, making number four and gracing the ten for eight weeks. Vinton came from Cannonsburg, Pennsylvania, the same town as Perry Como, and has two streets named after him, not one, but two. I guess you could say he was kind of a big shot in Cannonsburg, but I shouldn't joke about him because men of his calibre are hard to come by. In at six, it's transplanted Texan PJ Provey, who is the great-grandson of notorious bad man John Wesley Harden, who was very soon enshrined in folk and country music as John Hardy, John Harden, and John Wesley Harding. Provey is probably most famous for an incident where he split his trousers during a UK show and was banned, subsequently, from every theatre in Britain as a result. Now, this is hysterical and overreaction enough, but... What makes it really strange is that he split his pants across the knees, not anywhere that could be considered even remotely offensive, and that effectively killed his career, nonetheless. If you're outraged at the treatment that was handed out to PJ Provey, this is the time to aggravate your collective sense of outrage to hyper levels with The Trade Up, the segment where we look at records that were on the charts this week but which were cruelly denied the chance ever to make the top 10. And there are two on this week that will really make you wonder what the hell was going on with local record buyers in 1965. The first one is, is a more interesting case than a travesty, but it's the only girl who ever truly won Morrissey's heart, Sandy Shaw with Girl Don't Come. 
More famous for her mid-60s Euro bangers, Girl Don't Come has far more charm than any of these and was banned in the US. No one knows why. A puny five weeks on the charts for a top of 32. Now, the first of our unfathomable didn't make the top 10 moments, The Promised Land by Chuck Berry, surely one of his greatest songs in a catalogue of countless great songs, never made any higher than number 28, hanging around for eight weeks and doing uh, so. five, the crucial epicenter of the top 10. Here's another example of how local record buyer makes unfathomable decision. Petula Clark's Downtown, a song everybody knows, an iconic record of the 1960s, which never got any higher than number four, despite being a number one in the US and a number two in the UK. Jimmy Page, he of Led Zeppelinist renown, played guitar on this record. If you ever want a really good laugh, have a listen to Frank Sinatra's version of Downtown, which he recorded, obviously, very much the worse for drink. Number four is The Drifters, the group that Downtown was initially pitched to with Saturday Night at the Movies, another song written by Barry Mann and Cynthia Wheel. You can see it's all starting to knit together now. The Drifters were by now a husk of the groundbreaking group that they'd been in the early 50s, and this was in fact to be their last ever US Top 40, although they did stage an early 70s resurgence in the UK and Australia with a few solid hits on the Bell label. Four is where this topped out, and from there it fell quickly off the charts being done with a month later. Are you ready for number three? It's one of those songs that has a complicated chart history, The Wedding by Julie Rogers. It's tricky because the charts for this period of time, early 1965, are a bit sketchy, so I have to piece them together the best I can. And that means there are six songs, Ain't That Loving Your Baby, which unfortunately was a number one for Elvis, The Wedding, Second Tide by Billy Thorpe and the Aztecs, Ringo by Lord Green, That's Where It's At by Sam Cooke, and Something There to Remind Me by Sandy Shaw, that I sort of have to cobble together from chart information I find here and there. Also, all of this week's top 10, with the exception of YLTLF, have, to some degree, missing or questionable data, not so much as to throw the chart out of balance. All the arrival and departure and top peak dates are correct. There are just little things that I can tweak as I learn more. The Wedding is the most interesting example. It's a bit too here and there for my liking. Anyway, Julie Rogers had a number one with this in the UK. The song is absolute piffle, but Rogers is an okay singer. She's no pet Clark even. And in the marketplace where Dusty Springfield is the top of the food chain, the alpha, the queen. No one's going to remember Julie Rogers very long, are they? The terrific two this week is the great Del Shannon with Keep Searching. An ultimately tragic figure, Shannon managed three local number ones and two number twos in my town. Keep Searching, it is calculated, only made number nine nationally before he faded from the scene in the wake of the band formerly known as the Silver Beatles, a band which he in some small way managed to presage by being the first American act to cover one of their songs from Me To You, which made number 21 locally in 1963. Here are some amazing facts that will amaze you. Iceland is the only country in the world that has no mosquitoes. In Australia, we call mathematics maths, and in the US, they call it math. In a rare turn up for the books, the Americans are actually the grammatically correct ones. During the course of this video, I will mention the word Beatles 21 times. Oh, those facts are a bit rubbish, weren't they? Well, here's some really good ones. It's Val's fantastic world of fact. Top riser on this week's charts were two songs, not one, but two songs by the Rolling Stones, their version of Under the Boardwalk, which was of course made famous by the Drifters, <laughs> and their original Heart of Stone, both up a gargantuan 17 spots. Gotta say, not the most inspiring double from the scruffy Londoners, but never feared better soon would come. Doing the downward dive is the Sandals, from the previously imperious 13 to the more humble 26, with a theme from the classic surf film, Endless Summer. Guess what? It ended and you'll never hear surf music again, or some guy once said anyway. Highest debutante this week was Jay and the Americans with Let's Lock the Door and Throw Away the Key. Interesting melody, but J-A-T-A, -A, later Donald Fagan and Walt Becker's first employers, are just too lightweight to make anything of it. And the longest running entry this week on the charts is our good friend and neighbour Elvis Presley, with his former number one, Ain't That Loving You Baby, clocking up its 15th weekend. El Supremo in the beacon of the free world this week is You've Lost That Love and Feeling by the group that definitely wasn't the Beatles, the Righteous Brothers, or as they say in Mexico, Los Hermanos Justos. Over in the land that still had not yet won a World Cup, the number one was The Searchers with the jaunty needles and pins, a great artifact of the era. 
Back a year ago, it was Pete Best's old band, The Beatles, in person, who topped the charts in the midst of a three-month run for I Wanna Hold Your Hand, and a year later they were up to it again with the uber groovy day tripper winking and nudging its way at the tippity top of the tippity top tops. Number one album in town this week was, as expected, the best Beatles tribute band in the world, The Beatles, in Flagrante Delicto, with the rather cobbled together sounding Beatles for Sale album, which spent 11 weeks at the top to be tumbled by the sound of music beginning its incredible 76 week run. You know, we've seen an awful lot of the actual Beatles themselves here on this channel, more than I'd like to, frankly. But I have to say, nothing boosts the traffic like hashtag Beatles in the video description, and nothing starts a good hate wave in the comments like a Beatles ranking list. So here are their English released albums that they put out in their lifetime, ranked by the quality of their opening track. 13. Yellow Submarine. Well documented in this channel how much I hate the title song Beyond Words, but look at the shit on this record. What else were they going to lead with? Well, Magical Mystery Tour. The title track is weak and tuneless, but at least it's energetic. The English version doesn't really offer anything better, but the US version could have flipped the sides and at least led out with the cheery, if egregious, hello goodbye. 11. Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. The opening title song is busy work written as a kind of calling card, and it sounds like it. Rates higher than the previous because at least it rocks weekly. The list starts to get a little more difficult from here on in. 10 is Revolver. The sign of a great album is that it can survive an opening song like Taxman that can best be described as having its moments, and Yellow Submarine and still be one of the greatest records ever made. 9. The White Album. Back in the USSR had a ding-dong battle with number 8, but ultimately loses out because number 8 has Ringo beating the living daylights out of the drums, and USSR has Macca struggling to stay on the stool. 8. With the Beatles. It Won't Be Long is a great album opener, high on energy, with, as I indicated, Ringo going all GBH on his kit. Nowhere near as well remembered or regarded as the previous two or even three songs, it's better suited as a rabble rouser at the start of the true Beatle Maniac album than any of the others were in their era. 7. Let It Be. The band had tried a low-key opener with Taxman that didn't quite come off, but it works beautifully here. If there's one Beatle album I'm currently warming to, it's Let It Be because of the low bar, no expectations nature of the record. 6. Beatles For Sale. It was either 8 days a week or No Reply, and I like that they went with No Reply. It's a strong song, but it's not what the fans expected that EDAW would have been. Low-key works well, again. 5. Help. Opening with the title track is like playing an ace when the rest of your hand is a jack supported by off-trump eights or sixes. A great song, a great opener to an album that largely disappoints. 4. Abbey Road. There was only going to be one song that opened that album and Come Together did the job brilliantly, becoming in a lot of ways the model for opening album tracks from then on. Brilliant song, brilliantly made record, perfect album opener. 3. A Hard Day's Night. Cool as a breeze on a summer's day, this title track, a peak Beatlemania anthem, announces what I dare say is the most undervalued Beatles album, and an album full of rambunctious, beatle tunes that each could have opened the album splendidly themselves. 2. Please Please Me. 1, 2, 3, 4. Yeah, no contest. What a way to announce yourself. 1. Rubber Soul, naughty, funky, rocking, bright, breezy, and just about the grooviest thing the world had ever heard. Drive My Car opens an album that shifted the axis of popular music, the perfect opener to any album, and seemingly inseparably paired with the track that followed, which would have been my second choice to open up. Great days for fans of freedom. We've managed to get Monty out of the Huskow, who has held on ridiculous charges by paying a $355 million fine. So here he is to drum us back into the number one hit. And at the top of the tree this week is an Aussie legend, Billy Thorpe and the Aztecs with his wonderful cover of Over the Rainbow. This is the record that put Albert Productions, later Albert Records, on the map. The easy beats were soon to debut and consolidate things, but Thorpey had another number one with I Told the Brook later this year, and it was this record that proved to the Albert's company that young Ted's pipe dream was viable. So indirectly, if you like ACDC, you owe it all to this record. As for Billy Thorpe, a Brisbane boy by the way, to my mind was the greatest rocker Australia ever produced. The stories about him are legion, legend, and probably even the majority of them are true. He could do anything, he did everything, and I'll tell you what, I can only think of four times I've ever actually been sad when a musician died. I was inconsolable when Mark Boland went. I pondered my own mortality as I was still struggling with my diagnosis when David Bowie died. I was distraught for days when Chrissy Amphlett was taken from us. And I went through all five stages pretty hard when Thorpey suddenly, unexpectedly, in 2007 died at the same age as me. Top like Thorpey.
Well, there we have it, folks. That is how the cow ate the cabbage for the week ending Valentine's Day 1965. Now, I want you to all go away now and play some peak Albus music. And not just ACDC. Blast out Poison Ivy by Thorpey, I'll Make You Happy by The Easy Beat, Evie by Stevie Wright, Jump In My Car by Ted Mullery, or Am I Ever Gonna See Your Face Again by The Angels, and keep playing them until the TRB on the History of Albert Records comes out shortly. While you're doing that, know that if the good lords are willing and the creeks don't rise, We'll be back to do this all again next week. Ish.